enjoy and worship. And that's the part that we really want to make sure that we do, is that when we, we come together, we come together to worship. The, the Greek word is proskuneo. It means to kneel and to kiss. And we're, we're coming here to proskuneo. We're coming here. And so I, I'm not the worship uh, leader. Zayden is. Uh, but I love to worship. And I do my best. So the joyful noise is up to you. I will do my best to, to hit the chords right. Michael will try to stay with me. And I'll try to stay with him. And we're giving it all to him. Amen. That's right. That's what we'll do. God, we love you, God. We love you so much. And we thank you for an opportunity just to sing your praises and to worship you, Lord, and to bring our hearts under your covering, under your guidance. So, Lord, we ask that you lead us and guide us now as we, we come to Proskuneo, Lord. We come to kneel and to kiss. We come to offer up worship to you, Lord God. So, God, hear our hearts as we sing in Jesus' name. Amen. You can stand or sit, whatever you would like. You're welcome tonight. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, feeling every heart. I worship you, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, many every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, Waymaker miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, Way miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are, 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 that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop. You never stop working. 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 I'm going to land it there because I got something to say that our God never slumbers nor sleeps, Scripture says. And so you don't, you don't have to take time out. God doesn't take a time out. Because what he does is he, he never stops working. And that's why we worship him. That's why we, 
We, we have confidence that hey, we have a God that is constantly on our vigil. He's constantly there. And so he never stops. He never stops. And I'm thankful for that, that he does that. You know, we come here tonight, and there's reasons why we come. And a lot of it has to do with where our hearts are at. All who are thirsty. said, where can we go, Lord? You alone have the words of eternal life. Lord, we, we don't have life. Lord, you're the only one that can speak life and bring healing. Lord, to the pain and the sorrow, Lord, we ask that you'd wash away, Lord, wash away those areas, Lord, and cleanse our hearts and minds. Lord, guide us into your presence. As we get into your word, we ask it, Lord, that you would just come and hear us, Lord, as we come to hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Okay, Nehemiah chapter 9. Now, at this point in Nehemiah, as we've been going through his uh, call back to Jerusalem and the gathering of the people, remember they've had a few instances with some guys that had come in and caused some problems. And then now they have a problem 
where uh, they're going to be looking at the genealogy and the registry of the people. So the people gather in the open square there by the water gate there. And, and as they're going through the genealogies, they're finding out that there's some of the people weren't kosher. Best way to put it, they weren't kosher. And so they, they're saying, wait a minute, you're, you're accepted, you're not, and so on and so forth. So they gathered together, and as they did, they asked Ezra to go through the law and begin to read. So as he did, they all stood in awe and honor of God's word as, God, as Ezra was reading. And as he did, it said that he read distinctly from the book. He brought the sense and then gave the meaning. In other words, he was helping them to understand what the word of God was about and the law was about. And soon as, it, and soon as he did, great conviction began to come upon their hearts because of the, of the Holy Spirit touching the word of God. And that's what happens. When we hear the word of God and we fall under conviction, there's, first of all, there's conviction, there's challenge, and then there's comfort. The three, I call them the three C's. The conviction comes that, you know, I'm in sin. Uh, God forgive me. That's the first thing. Then there's the challenge. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, you turn and repent. And then comes the comfort. You know what the comfort is? The comfort is found in, in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So that's the comfort. I get comforted. I get forgiven. And I get, I get this ability now to let that go and walk on and take it. And that's what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to stay in the other side. He wants us to walk on. So they began to weep. The people began to weep because as they heard how they had failed God in his word, they began to weep because of the brokenness and the conviction there. And Nehemiah steps in and he begins to rebuke them. He rebukes them because this was a time uh, to be a rejoicing. Why? Because repentance. In repentance, there should be a re time of rejoicing. You have a family friend. You have a, somebody in your family or a friend that's been in sin, had been messing up, and they repent and they turn and they begin. What do you do? You get excited. You get happy. And it's like the, the it, repentance is a time of rejoicing. You know, it's a brokenness, true. It is a broken time of brokenness, but it's also a time of rejoicing. Remember the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, verse 32. After this whole ordeal, the son goes away, comes back. The other son's all jealous and everything. And, and so Jesus said, it was right that we should make merry. Speaking of the dad concerning the son. In other words, rejoice. This, we should have a party and be glad for your brother who was dead is alive again. And was lost and is found. That's repentance. That takes us to a place when we see somebody turn from sin and turn back to the Lord and turn with their whole heart. That's a time of rejoicing. That's what Nehemiah is saying. So Ezra, he's, he reads the law for six days. Wow. Six days they're, they're in the word. That's a six day Bible study, you know, going on. This, on the second day, the fathers, the priests, and they came, uh, the elders, and they came uh, to Ezra, and they, they had some questions about the law because they found something that they had been in error about. They found out that they had been in error concerning the Feast of the Tabernacles. They hadn't been keeping it, and it stemmed uh, the reason that for their error is because they had failed to be in the Word of God. That's a constant. If you're going to find error in your life, it's going to be because you haven't been in the Word of God. We need to stay close to the Word of God. The Word of God needs to stay close to us. And the closer that we stay to it, the more that it stays close to us by the Holy Spirit. Because he brings back to our remembrance everything that we're planting. You're planting right now. As you're hearing the word of God, you're planting. And in those moments, in that time when you need it, he will bring that back to your thoughts. So they found they'd been in error because they hadn't been keeping it. And they also found out that they hadn't been keeping it from the time of Joshua. So they got busy and started building these little booths called sukkahs. And so they had their little sukkahs outside in their homes and they're made out of palm branches and leaves and everything. And, and this lasted for, uh, for days. And then so on the eighth day, there was to be a solemn celebration. And then, and then around 430, 450 years later on this same feast day, this is where Jesus would stand up and cry out in John 7, 37, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And what they would do is they would come up on the temple mount with these big jars of water. 
And what they would do is they would come over to, the, to, to, to remember the time in the wilderness when uh, God told Moses to speak to the rock and water would come out. Well, that's the first time he obeyed, right? What did he do the second time? He struck the rock. Disobedience, okay? Because that's, he dishonored God because God didn't tell him to strike the rock. He told him to speak to it. And he says, I'm not mad at these people. You made it sound like I was mad at him. So he misrepresented God there. Well, these priests, they come up and they pour out this water symbolizing the water that came out of the rock because the stones, they're all around the temple area. They pour it out. So coming back to our, our text here in chapter 9. When true conviction takes place, there's brokenness that goes along with us. Conviction and brokenness go hand in hand. You have to have a, a contrite heart, a broken heart. See, they'd just been celebrating because Nehemiah had said, hey, no, no, it's a time of celebration. But see, the conviction of their error was still there. I, I still know what I did. And they needed time. So here in, in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Now, in this, we know back in uh, chapter 8, verse 2, the first day of the seventh month. So this is the same month, but it's 23 days later. So, I want you to notice the three things that take place here as they mourn. Uh, they begin fasting. They have sackcloths, you know, like burlap or rough, you know, bags or whatever you want to call. Throwing dust on their heads and so on. All of these deal with a, the idea of afflicting your soul or your flesh. Fasting denies you the pleasure or the enjoyment of eating. So that's, that's another act of of uh, afflicting in yourself. And then uh, the sackcloth was, it was kind of like, here God, see how much I'm willing to, I'm willing to put this on and, and I, I really feel bad. It was just a remorse. It was a sign of remorse. And then also throwing dust on your head was a sign of mourning. You know, like when someone would die, they would throw dust on their head and they'd throw ashes and so on. So it was a time for mourning. It was a time for them to mourning and because they had failed to keep God's word. They, they wanted to show God, you know, see our hearts. Well, God already knew their hearts. He, knew, he knows our hearts even before we know what's in our hearts. You know, but sometimes we have, there has to be a contact for our faith. There has to be something. It's not that w what we do, but it's how we do it. It's from your heart when we come there. You know, God knows. He knows it because they needed to express their remorse. When you're broken, when I'm broken because of some sin... I need to sit back and make a contact with God and say, you know, um, walk in the light as he is in the light, you know, and, the, and his blood, Jesus Christ, will cleanse us from all our sin. Confess your sins, you know. He is faithful and just, you know, all those verses. I need to have a contact with God when I say, I'm sorry, Lord God. And God already knows. He knows where I'm at. And he's the one doing the convicting. But I need to come for my sake, for myself to say, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, forgive me. I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to say it. I need to make contact with God. God's already there waiting, saying, come on in, Dan. I'm waiting. Come on in. And see, that's where, where our, the condition of our hearts, God already knows that. You know, in Psalm 44, verse 21, said, would not God search out this out? Yeah, he does. For he knows the secrets of the heart. He knows what's going on. He, we can't hide anything from him. And so it's best to just come clean, right? Just come clean. Now, if I wanted, I, as I read this next part, I just kind of chuckled. If you ever complained about our service being too long, be thankful we don't do this, okay? Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all the foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers, and they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshiped the Lord God. Whoa. Okay, let's, let's, let's do the math. 
Their day was divided up into four parts. Six in the morning till noon, noon till six in the evening, six in the evening till midnight, midnight till six in the morning. So the fourth part was from six in the morning till noon. Okay, that's six hours, okay? The other fourth part was noon till six. That's a 12-hour church service. Yeah, not today. <laughs> not today. People, I'm halfway through my message and people are going like this. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, when we worship, you ever notice if a song goes too long, how people begin to drop off in their singing? You ever notice that? Especially up here on the worship team, you probably see it. You know, it goes too long, too long. That, that's how come Mike and I work together, but I'm a mess when I try to lead worship. I'll sit back and I'll just cut it off like I did on that last song. But sometimes I just feel like, you know what, that's enough. That's enough. We need to, we need to keep our worship worshipful and we need to stop it when it needs us. Well, I wonder what we would have done in a worship service like this. Six hours? Twelve hours? What's going on? Their worship didn't drop off. What did it do? It got deeper. It got deeper. Something was going on here. And that only happens when the Holy Spirit is involved. When he's there, he takes us deeper. He takes us deeper. Then Jeshua, Benai, this guy, that guy, this guy, that guy, this guy, stood on the stairs of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. And the Levites, Jeshua, Kedmiel, Benai, uh, that guy, that guy, and that guy, and that guy. And Pethahiah said, Stand up. Now keep an eye on this guy, Pethahiah. Uh, he's, he's a good guy. St he said, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. He's the spokesman. He's the preacher. here. Bless be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. So here they are, the leaders and the people. They're standing up. They're worshiping the Lord. Um, and some may not have been standing. So Pethahiah says, you know, hey, come on, stand up, you guys. Stand up and bless the Lord your God. You know, in some services, people stand up when the word of God is, is written or is, is spoken. You know, um, I love going to some of my friends going in, going to a Seder, you know, or going to a synagogue. They're, I love it. I love it when they, they come and they put the, the prayer shawl over their head and they got the yarmulke on and they're, and they're honoring and worshiping God. I mean, it's cool. It's cool. And I love it when I see that taking place in, in our church, in our fellowship. When we stand in honor of God's word, I, I, think, it's, I think it's great. I, I bless God for it. And this is what Pethahiah is saying. He says, bless the Lord your God forever and ever. I, I want you to notice how they worship. They, they Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all Blessing and praise. And when he says, Lord God, he's saying Yahweh. Yahweh, or I am. The great I am, or the becoming one. The I am, the Yahweh. He becomes our need. Whatever our need is, he becomes that. And they understood that. They understood Yahweh. Uh, he is the self-existent one. He doesn't depend on anyone. You remember at the bush, not George, you guys got to catch some of my stuff. At the bush, Moses, he told Moses, I am who I am. He says, who am I going to say sent me? He says, I am that I am. I am. Well, you know, this is where the Pharisees got all bent out of shape when Jesus was asked who he was. And Jesus said in Mark 14, 62, he said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. What was he saying there? He was saying, Yahweh, I'm Yahweh. Whoa. That's why they wanted to kill him. I'm Yahweh. Yahweh is standing in your midst, Yahweh. So true, true prayer, worship begins with the acknowledgement, as you see, Pethahiah. He is acknowledging the vastness and the greatness of God. And he's still speaking here in verse 6. He says, you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven the heavens of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, you preserve them all. The hosts of heavens 
worship you. I want you to notice the singularity of God. You alone are the Lord. In other words, there's no other. You stand alone. There's no other one beside you. And then he acknowledges the vastness of the universe and creation and how it all belongs to him. It all belongs to him. And then when it says, when he says, you preserve them all, he's saying, you are the one who holds it all together. Now, does that sound familiar someplace else in the New Testament? Colossians, doesn't it? Colossians 1.16 uh, and 17, he says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Here it is. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Hold together. Wow. Okay, let's, let's do a little bit of, of uh, um, science here. Within the nucleus of an atom, there's a cluster of positive charged protons. Now, the nature of those protons is to uh, rebel or repel away from the nucleus. But they, they don't. Why? Why don't they? Well, scientists, they call it, you know, atomic glue, but, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. Well, we've seen what happens, you know, when uh, the power of an atom is upset, the balance of an atom is upset. We bombard the nucleus, if we bombard the nucleus with slow-moving neutrons, they, they cause this tremendous effect, which is called an atomic explosion. So when the balance of power within the atom is upset, it just follows its natural course to repel, to go out. And that's where we have this great, huge explosion. But the question is, how great is the power, the need for the power that's unleashed, how great is the power that holds it together? How great is the power that holds it together? These positive charges together what God is, is that he is the one that's holding all the... Some, I heard, I think it was Chuck Missler said, all that God has to do is say, okay, release all atoms. Can you imagine what would happen? Everything. There's enough, there's enough atomic weight in this, in this little piece right here to blow this whole city away if you could divide that atom. Can you imagine the universe being told, release, let go. God lets go of the constraint that he has. That's power. That's our God. That's who Pethahiah is speaking of here. So they worship God first for the, being the creator. Now they're going to worship him for his faithfulness. Pethahiah is still speaking. You are the Lord God who chose Abram, and brought him out of the Ur of Chaldees and gave him his, the name Abraham, father. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land to the Canaanites, give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and all the termites and Gegushites to give it to his descendants. You have performed your word for you are righteous. In other words, you were faithful to Abraham. You were faithful to him and you changed his name. You came, you brought him out of the Chaldeans and you named him Father. You were faithful. God was faithful. And he did it in front of all these nations, all these corrupt nations. He showed himself faithful to Abraham. Do you know that God wants to show himself faithful to you too? He wants to show himself. Faithful. Psalm 138, verse 2. If you guys don't know this one, you might want to go there and underline it and keep it, put a dog ear in your Bible. But Psalm 138, verse 2 says this, and I don't think I gave it to Mike to put up, but it says, you have magnified your word above all your name. You have magnified your word above all your name. In other words, God honors his word. He can't help himself. That's who he is. That is what we were saying about. That is who you are. That's who you are. 
He honors his word above his own name because that is who he is because he's righteous. It's the right thing. He always does the right thing. So Pahiah, he's still talking. This guy's, a, this guy's going on and on, man. I, I love this guy. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted proudly against them. You, so you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the Red Sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And their pre- persecutors you threw into the deep as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar and by night with a pillar of fire. You gave them light on the road which they, <clears throat> which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai and you spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. Notice how he's identifying with the ordinances and the laws and everything. They're good. They're all good. They're all good. Everything about God. The, 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 the law is good converting the soul. And what it does is it convicts us. So as he's reading this and as he's rehearsing this, it sounds like something out of Exodus or Deuteronomy. It sounds like you're going back from the Exodus and coming out of Egypt and going into the promised land, crossing over into the wilderness. So Pahiah, he takes him through the history from Abraham to the birth and their bondage in Egypt until the deliverance of God's mighty hand and then into the wilderness. Now, um, for those of you who've been to Israel, you know it gets pretty hot during the summer. We were there three years ago, I think it was, during the summer. And it was over 100, and we were down by the Dead Sea, and it was over 120 degrees. And that was just, that was in the shade. So can you imagine, I couldn't even imagine, I'm thinking about these buildings. God sent a, a cloud during the day. Thank you, Lord, for the cloud. And even with that, the, in the shade, it was over 120 degrees. Can you imagine so he, he provides them with this, this, this cloud to give relief and then light and this pillar of fire by night to give them warmth and a, a nice street light for them to see where they are and what they're doing so they can, you know, just have, a, have an evening. Psalm 19, verse 7, David said, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Well, how does it do that? The law is perfect, okay, we, 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 you know, I know we're not under law, so we're not going to go there. But it's perfect. I want to make sure that we emphasize this tonight. The law of God is perfect, and it converts the soul. What it does, it becomes a magnifying glass upon our sin. And it shows me where I have fallen, just like it did with them. When they read the law, remember they began to weep and cry because the word of God began to illuminate to them where they had failed about the Feast of the Tabernacles, where they had not obeyed, where they had failed to keep the word, where they had failed to not be in the word. So the law is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The testimony of the Lord, it tells us this. By the law shall no flesh be justified. I can't do it. That's his testimony. So what is he going to do? He's going to provide a way so that I can be made right before him through his son, Jesus Christ. He's already determined it, but the law in the law, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Everything that God says is sure. It's going to happen, making wise the simple. I don't know everything, but when God shows us to us, Holy Spirit, he's the teacher. Jesus said that you have no need that any man should teach you, but you have the Holy Spirit. He is the one who makes us wise. He's the one who makes us discerning. He's the one who shows the difference between truth and error. He's the one, not me. It's him. And so we need him, and that's he makes wise the simple. You know, the, the definition of wisdom is the right application of knowledge. The right application of knowledge. That's wisdom. You know which way to go and you know the right way to go, then you're going to go that way. To choose not to is to sin. Now, I know you've all heard this. You know, you've heard different Christians say, well, 
I'm glad I, we're not under the law, but under grace. Okay, you know, That can be an easy cop out to sin, let me tell you. Because a lot of times you can depend so much on grace. Shall, shall we sin that grace should abound? Paul said to the Romans, God forbid. Should, should we use grace as a crutch or a tool to go into sin? No way. The reason why Jesus came was to deliver us from the bondage of sin, death, and hell. Deliver us to give us the power to be able to walk in the light as he is in light. That's why he came. So that I could walk in the spirit and not fulfill the deeds of the flesh. That's why he came. He came to give me victory. The Jews couldn't see it. They understood that they, they, they misunderstood in the respect that they thought by doing the law that they were fulfilling the righteousness of God in, that, in their own flesh. And that wasn't what God was trying to teach them. He was trying to teach them, you can't do it. You think you're doing it, but you're not. You're falling short of my glory. So the law is good, as David said. It's perfect. It's good. It's righteous. It's holy. The law of God is the right way to live. It's the right way to live. With our relationship, not only with God, but with Man, you know, the, the Ten Commandments are divided into two parts. You all know that, right? One side is pertaining to God, and the other side is pertaining to our relationship with each other. We have laws in our country. We have laws in our society based on the, the, our Constitution on the Ten Commandments. They, they reflect our heritage. Now, I want to just say the world would be a lot better off if it followed after the instructions of the law in government and in society. Now, I'm not saying that we should be under the law because by, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. I'm not talking about justification. I'm talking about the quality of life, the way life would be, the way government would be. If our government followed after that, we'd be in a lot better place. We'd be in a lot better place. But I, what I'm saying is if we have to have laws, let's have righteous laws. Let's have righteous laws that are pertaining to the, to the law of God, which our forefathers endeavored to, to give to us. Our faith in Jesus Christ doesn't release us from the necessity of the need of God's law. I mean, it's there. It's there to tell us. Um, how many times are you convicted because Maybe you, you're, you stretch the truth about, I went fishing the other day and I caught a fish that big and it was really that big, you know? Bearing false witness, well, that's the law of God. And, and that's why we need to have that as, as a parameter holder in our lives that, okay, Dan, you have a tendency to exaggerate. You need to constrain your exaggeration, you know? Do you see how that's work, how that does? But it doesn't, it doesn't make me right in the respect of my righteousness before God because my righteousness is filthy rags. This is nothing. But what it does is it gives me guidance in the right way to live my life. And so the law is good. And, and our faith in Christ, he's the one who fulfilled the law. You know, we put our trust in him. This is how we accomplish it. We put our trust in him and he, by walking with him and walking him, with him in the spirit, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Apart from the law, I can't do it. Apart from my help with Jesus, I mean, I can't do it. I, I need him. It's my faith in his son. It's my faith in Jesus Christ. It's your faith in Christ. Because, see, he fulfilled the law for you and me. So my faith, I live by the faith of the son of God. I live by, by trusting him. I fall short. I agree with God, you're right. Jeremiah says, only acknowledge your sin. I, I agree, God, you're right and I'm wrong. But I want to follow you, so I turn away from me and I pick up my cross and I follow him and then everything falls in place. But it's when I get out of line, when I do something in my own strength and my own reasoning and my own opinion, that's when things get all messed up. So the way that we do this, we walk through that that, that promise of the Father that Jesus gave to us, that Terry in Jerusalem, when we have that promise of the Father, we have that infilling and the ability, the power of the Holy Spirit. 
You know, people get all hung up about the Holy Spirit, and they get all hung up about, you know, because of the gifts and all that stuff. Forget all that for right now. I'm talking about the ability to walk and talk and be that person here in this life by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. I need him. You need him. The church needs him. The world needs him. He is here dwelling with us to infill us, to empower us so that we can obey. I can't even obey without God helping me to obey. Philippians 2.13. This is a good one because see, who's working here? He never stops working. He never stops working. Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He works both in you to will. I want my will to be in your heart. I want my will to be in you. But see, you don't have it. You don't have the ability to do it. So I'm going to do it through you. I'm going to do it through you by the Holy Spirit. I work both to will and to do. He wants us not only to just hear about it, he wants us to live in it and walk in it and enjoy it. It's, it's awesome to walk in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's awesome to walk in this way when the Lord says, this is the way, walk in it, and you go, okay, yeah, Lord. Wow, oh, I see what you mean. And you catch the connection. There's nothing like it once you begin to make that connection, once we do. And there's a lot of connections, aren't there? There's a lot of connections. I'm, uh, every time we turn around, we find another connection that relates to where I am in my life. And so God wants to just say, okay, Dan, this is the way. Come on in. So when it comes to the law, he hasn't abolished it. He hasn't set it aside, just like Israel. He's not done with Israel. He hasn't abolished Israel. He hasn't replaced Israel. He's not done with Israel. And he's not done with the law either. The law is here. It's good. It's converting the soul. It's testimonies of the Lord are sure. Instead, it's, he's, he's providing a way, as I've said, about walking it by faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's impossible in the flesh, possible in the Spirit. Okay? Impossible in our own strength to walk in the law of God. It's impossible. Why? It's a God thing. It's a God thing. But when a, the God thing of the Holy Spirit himself comes, he makes a way to be able to do what he says. Psalm 1, verse 1 and 3 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. Notice the progression. He's walking, he's standing, and then he stopped. Okay? There's a progression here. Blessed is the man who walks not, isn't walking in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands or stops in the path of sinners. He stops and he starts listening, nor sits in the seat of scornful. He's walked, he stopped, and now he's sitting. I'm going to tell you, there's a progression here. You don't fall into sin, you walk into sin. Sin is there. But his delight, instead, the repentant heart is his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water with, with, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. That's a promise. So I look at where we are as believers in Jesus Christ and trusting him. I want to walk in that. I want to walk in the life. I want to walk in that ability to, to be a light. I mean, you know, the Jews were to be a light among the Gentiles. And they failed to do that. You know, not all of them. I got to say, I can't, you can't clump them all together, but the majority of them did. But see, now that the charge has been given to the church until uh, the time when the Lord would come and, and uh, bring Israel in, all of Israel. But the charge has been given to us you to be a light to be set upon the hill that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The charge has been given to us. And Peter would say, you see the end of these times, what manner of people 
a man should you be? A woman should you be? What kind of people are we? Well, we need to be people of light, of holiness, of purity, of righteousness. Those are, those are the callings of who we are. We are. We're different. We're peculiar people. We're to be set apart different. And um, I don't know, have you ever been called peculiar? If you're different, yeah. Well, you know who the difference maker is, right? Jesus makes the difference. And uh, I'm going to pray tonight that the Lord would make a difference here for us. Uh, just as he did here with these people as they heard the word of God. And it just cut them. Cut them to the, to the heart. And they began to realize, you know what? And, and, and a lot of times when we're, we're going through a message, there, I call it the message in the message. There's, there's things that God would say to you that I haven't even said. And listen to what he says. Listen to what the Holy Spirit says. And if he's speaking to you about something in your life, then you need to deal with it. Or if he's giving you a well done, good and faithful servant, just sit back and rejoice in it because you're, you're walking in where he wants you to walk, wherever you are. Let's let the Holy Spirit just do his work in us tonight. And uh, we'll just pray and, and allow him to speak. If, if you have a song, you have a word, um, you have something that you would just feel led to share, maybe from the word or whatever, or just prayer. It doesn't matter. We're just here to wait on the Holy Spirit and just let him speak, okay? All right. Lord, we thank you for an evening to sit with you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your uh, constant presence, Lord. We thank you, God, that you never slumber nor sleep. We thank you that you're for us. You're on our side, Lord. We thank you that you have a future and a hope for us, Lord. So, Lord, we come to call on you, Lord, and just ask God, minister. Use your people, Lord. Use those. Help them to have, Lord, that fearlessness to speak, Lord. Not to be afraid to speak out for the benefit of someone else, Lord. Just help us, Lord God. We need you in Jesus' name.